two. Not sure what else was happening in this conference, but uh, so our first speaker uh, is remote. Uh, the speaker is Yu Shen, telling us about permissionless clock synchronization with public setup. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Yu Shen, and uh, I'm going to present our paper, Permissionless Clock Synchronization with Public Setup. This is a joint work with Huan Garai and uh, Agalos Kiyas. So clock synchronization has been a fundamental problem in the distributed systems. And it mainly asks if a set of the processors can realize logical clocks that satisfy two synchronization conditions. The first one is called precision. And uh, it mainly asks that honest parties can maintain close logical clocks or say, uh, the skills among these parties are bounded. And the second condition is called accuracy. Accuracy requires that honest parties can report a time that is meaningful with respect to the real time. Or in other words, it should stay in a linear envelope of the real time. So this problem has been studied for more than 40 years. And uh, there are some protocols that can achieve this optimal skill and optimal linear envelope. However, we highlight here that all the protocols listed in this slide, uh, actually they run in a permission environment, which means that parties have some knowledge a priori, like they know the number of the parties or they know a PKI. So if a new party wants to join, actually only one paper here considers the newly joined parties. If a new party wants to join, that party has to gain sufficiently many permission from the existing parties. And after the join, uh, all the parties, they need to update their internal state, like they need to update the total number of the parties. However, with the emergence of Bitcoin and its underlying blockchain protocol, which runs in an environment that parties can join and leave by their will, these classical synchronization protocols are challenged by such a permissionless environment. So here you can see that in this new environment, the number of the parties can be dynamic and they can come and go without notifying anyone else. Also in this new environment, we have different setups. Like for public setup, we have common reference string or say a genesis block in the blockchain context. We also have private setup like proof, proof of stake, which is different from the previous PKI setup, mainly because in proof of stake, parties will not know the activation level of all the stakes. So for permissionless protocols, they can no longer use the number of the parties or say the number of the corrupted ones in the protocol logic. And that's because they completely lose the ability to count. They lose the, this ability to count due to the fact that the number of the parties will, be, will never be known to the, the number of the parties will never be known to the honest ones. And we have a different way to authenticate messages like by using proof, proof of work or proof of stake. So we conclude here that almost all the existing synchronization protocols will not work in this new environment with, on, with one exception, which is Ouroboros Kronos, and I will go through it later. So before we proceed, let's first take a look at clocks in Bitcoin. So in Bitcoin, the timestamp of a block mainly comes from three different sources. The first one is the miner's local system clock. It is usually adjusted adjusted via the NTP protocol, which is a centralized service and can suffer from the single point failure. And the second source is from the median of the clocks from peers. However, in the protocol, in Bitcoin protocol, it allows for some amount of the deviation. And if they do not agree, then it will ask for the human operator. So if you take a, take a look at the Bitcoin blockchain, then you can find that many blocks, they report timestamps that are earlier than their ancestors which means that the clocks in the Bitcoin network are not synchronized. However, we highlight here that this observation is actually not in line with the current understanding of Nakamoto consensus, where you can see that here in all the previous analysis, they assume parties have access to synchronized clocks. Also, there is a publicly accessible global clock. So while it is still good to ask if Nakamoto consensus is secure with the existing scheme in Bitcoin, we are more interested in if we can completely remove the global, the global clock assumption here. Yeah. So this asks 
for a permissionless clock synchronization protocol. So here we have one successful trial. It is the robust Kronos protocol, which is the, the first permissionless protocol that can do clock synchronization by using proof of stake. However, uh, the bad thing here is that the construction from Kronos cannot be directly applied in the proof of work context. And that's mainly because for proof of work, it has a different way to react to the party fluctuation. So if you directly run Kronos, then the protocol will eventually become insecure when the number of the parties keeps increasing or decreasing. So here, we are mainly interested in these two questions. First, by assuming a public setup and a proof of work, is there a permissionless clock synchronization protocol? And is there a proof of work protocol that does not have any dependency on public resources, on, on the external resources to help adjust its clocks? So in our paper, we provide a positive answer to these two questions. We present the first proof of work based protocol, which we call it timekeeper. And this, this protocol solves the permissionless clock synchronization problem. We can achieve precision and accuracy by assuming the bounded dynamic participation and honest maturity, which is defined in terms of the number of the random oracle queries. So in the rest part of this talk, I will present a high level overview of our protocol. So in the timekeeper protocol, what the parties will do is that they will, use, they will mine a proof of work blockchain. This part is trivial. Alongside with the mining process of this blockchain, they will use two for one proof of work to mine and diffuse sync messages, which are a special type of the blocks that will contain miners local time. So let me first ex explain what is two for one proof of work. So this is a technique that can compose multiple proof of work mining processes with access to a single random oracle. So here we have an illustration of the most simple case where you want to bind the mining process of Pi1 and Pi2 together. So you prepare the nonce and the input for Pi1 and Pi2 together to the random oracle. And then after you get the output, you check if this output and the reverse the string of this output, they satisfy certain conditions. If they do satisfy, then you successfully mine a block in the corresponding protocol. This primitive has many applications, like in the original work, it can help to improve the corruption threshold in the, Byzantine, in the proof of work based Byzantine agreement from one third to honest majority. And it can be used for if you want to build a parallel chance or to achieve fair reward sharing. So back to our timekeeper protocol, after we find the mining process of this proof of, proof of work blockchain and the mining process of sync messages together, what parties will do is that they will include these sync messages into this blockchain, like the regular transactions. And periodically, they will use this blockchain to reach consensus of the set of the sync messages. So here you can see that, um, and we call this a, a synchronization interval. At the end of a, a synchronization interval, uh, parties will have a consistent view of the set of the sync messages and uh, they will do some adjustment on their local clocks. So what they will do is that they will compute the delay of the sync messages. And the delay of a sync message can be extracted by comparing the time recorded in this message and its local arrival time. So after each party compares the delay for each sync messages, they will pick the median value of these delays and add it to their local clock. We can prove that by doing so, parties can maintain clocks that can satisfy precision and accuracy. And since this is a permissionless protocol, parties can join and leave. Yeah. So for the joining parties, we provide a mechanism for them to sync with honest parties. And we also note here that for the newly joined parties, they do not have any knowledge about the protocol time. What they know is that they only know the CRS or say the Genesis block. So after they join this protocol, they can bootstrap the blockchain from this Genesis block. And they will listen passively to, they will passively listen to this protocol. So after they observe a complete synchronization interval, they can have some information on the blockchain. And also they can bookkeep the local arrival time of all the sync messages. So they can do some similar adjustments like the honest parties. And by doing so, they can 
to say catch up and sync with all the honest parties. And we also highlight here that this joining process is passive, which means that after new parties join, uh, there's no need to update the internal state of any other parties. And also finally, uh, in, in the timekeeper protocol, we provide a new way to react to the party fluctuation. And uh, here, you know, uh, since you want to do the clock synchronization, it actually requires a secure permissionless proof of work blockchain. However, to get this secure proof of work blockchain, then you need a, an appropriate mining difficulty. So the problem here is that for all the existing ways to to say recalculate this mining difficulty, it requires a somewhat accurate timestamp. So you can see that here we have something that looks circular at the first glance. You want, you want to get a good mining difficulty, but it, it requires the accurate timestamp. Then if you want to get the accurate timestamp, it, it requires a good mining difficulty. So we solve this problem by introducing a novel target recalculation function which can be viewed as the reversed version of Bitcoin's original function. And in this new function, we completely remove the usage of timestamps. And then we can prove that this new function, it can help to the blockchain to react to the party, fluctu party fluctuation without hurting the synchronization mechanism. Um, yeah. And this is a very high level overview of our protocol. So since I do not have time to go through the models and the protocol details, let me just sum, uh, sum up all the things here. So in our paper, we present the first proof of work based protocol, Timekeeper, which can solve this permissionless clock synchronization problem. And uh, we can achieve those two, condition, uh, two conditions, precision and accuracy, which is by assuming the bounded dynamic participation and honest maturity in terms of the random work queries. And this brings to the end of my talk and uh, thank you for paying attention. Questions? So sorry if I missed some of the motivation, but can you can you talk a little bit about like what uh, like if you want to use a protocol like this, what you gain from having this uh, like permissionless synchronization? Yes, yes. So what you what you get is that you have a protocol that does not rely on any external resources, which means that it can be its own synchronizer. Yeah. So Sorry, you do not- the last part again? Yes. So it can become its own synchronizer, which means that you can synchronize the, the clocks by the by the protocol itself. Yes, yes, I yes, I understand that. But like uh like do you know if there's some yeah. like if there's some practical motivation where people want to be synchronizing within the protocol? Yes, yes, because uh, timestamp man manipulation can be, you know, a way to attack the, the permissionless blockchain protocols. So if you can self synchronize, then you can remove the, the, the vector of the timestamps from the possible attack. And so, and so how do protocols that don't have this property, how do they mitigate against this kind of problem? Uh, they have the ways to, their, their own ways to adjust uh, the, their timestamps. Like uh, what I said in Bitcoin, they were, use the peer, the, the values from the clocks from peers, or say that they rely on some third party services. Yeah. Got it, thank you. And so oh, that makes sense. Thanks a lot. Yeah. All right, uh, let's thank the speaker again. We'll wait a minute to start. Okay, our next speaker is Harry Eldridge. He'll be telling us about one-time programs from commodity hardware.
am I, am I on? Not yet. I am. Okay, great. Perfect. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, so this is a joint work between myself, Farushi Gol, Matt Green, Abhishek Jen, and Max Sinkus. So what are one-time programs? One-time programs are a sort of limited use uh, obfuscation first put forward by Goldwasser, Kawai, and Ruffbloom in 2008. And the idea is that it is a program that you can only run once. So Alice has some program that she wants to send to Bob so that Bob can execute it on a single input of his choice. So she processes it, it in some way to make it one time. She then sends the one-time program to Bob, who can now execute it on a single input and get some output. Now, the key property here is that at, a, that at a later time, Bob tries to execute this program on some other input, he gets nothing, right? The program has sort of self-destructed in some way. So I'm going to try and motivate my, why we might want to build these with a couple of applications. So a really natural application is limited attempt authentication. So say Alice has some sort of file that she wants to send to Bob, but she wants the file to be protected by a password, right? We have sort of standard ways to do this, but many of them are vulnerable to brute force attacks, right? Somebody may just guess a bunch of very common passwords, and if Alice uses a particularly terrible one, then they can, you know, extract the, the file from whatever sort of uh, protection she uses, right? But with one-time programs, we can get around this, right? Alice could, say, write a program that takes a password guess as input, and if it happens to be correct, up it's the file, right? She could now make this program one time and send that to Bob. Bob can input his password into the program as usual and get the file back. But if, you know, someone intercepted this in transit, they only have a single attempt to guess the password, right? So in this case, particularly weak passwords can actually offer a pretty decent amount of security. Okay, so a couple of other applications real quick here. One is something like differentially private data analysis. So say that I have some data set that I've added some noise to such that it's, uh, it's retains privacy up to like N aggregation queries. And I want a journalist to be able to make some queries against this data set. I could send them n different or n one-time programs, each of which allows a single query against the data, right? Now the journalist can make their queries on their own time, and I get to sleep soundly at night knowing that the privacy of my data won't be violated. Um, another sort of scarier application is autonomous ransomware. So in a typical ransomware attack, a uh, some sort of perpetrating group gets some malware on a machine that then encrypts all of the files on that machine, and they require some sort of bounty to be paid before giving the, uh, the victim the decryption key. This requires this communication between the uh, perpetrating group and the, uh, the machine, which is maybe a little bit more dangerous for the, the group or is also just a hassle, right? It means they essentially need like a customer service department. But with a, with a one-time program, we can make ransomware fully autonomous. We could ship along with the, uh, the ransomware a one-time program that takes a proof that some amount of cryptocurrency has been paid to some address on a blockchain, and then it verifies the proof is correct. And then if so, we'll output the decryption key. So now it's fully set and forget. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you that one-time programs are useful or at least interesting. So can we actually build them? Well, unfortunately, in the original paper that put them forward, they showed that you can't be realized only in software, right? The reasons for this should be fairly clear, right? Software can be copied. It can be executed in a virtual machine and then rewound, both of which would immediately destroy the one-time property that we want. So we need to change the model somehow, right? There are a couple of different approaches to this. There have been works that look at doing this with blockchains. As we saw yesterday, you can do this with proteins in, uh, you know, in test tubes. But what GKR do and what we continue with is using secure hardware, specifically some very, very simple secure hardware. The way GKR, GKR do this is they use something known as a one-time memory token. So a one-time memory, here we have Alice and Bob. Alice has her two, uh, two values, A and B, and she'd like Bob to learn exactly one of them. So she puts A and B into a token, and she sends the token to Bob. Bob can now choose to get one of these two values, either you know, the left or the right, the zero or the one index, and say he wants the zero index, he puts that into the token, he gets back A, and B is permanently destroyed, right? The other half is completely gone. This is sort of a non-interactive OT via secure hardware, right? And so the jump to, to one-time programs from these are actually fairly, fairly straightforward. Alice would garble a circuit and then take the two, uh, two labels for each input wire and put them into a one-time memory and then ship that collection of one-time memories off to Bob, who can get exactly one label and then execute the garbled circuit, but can't get any more, right? Okay, so that uses exactly one one-time memory token per input wire of the circuit. Okay, so despite the fact that we know how to do this, right, we still don't see one-time programs actually out in the world, right? So why might that be? Well, one-time memories, while simple, are sort of non-standard, right? There are no cloud providers that allow access to this. If somebody wanted to make like a smart card that implemented this, that would maybe require some development costs. But in general, right, one-time memories don't actually exist in the world. 
So this leads to the main question of our paper. Can we build one-time programs from hardware that is already widely available, right? Hardware that already exists in the world that consumers have access to right now. And we answer this question in the affirmative and our hardware of choice is the counter lockbox. So what is a counter lockbox? Counter lockbox is a piece of secure hardware that has three things inside of it. It has a secret, it has a password, and it has an attempt counter. And to use one, you input a guess at the password, and if your guess is correct, it will output the secret. However, if you input the wrong guess, you get nothing, and the attempt counter goes down by one. Finally, if you make a wrong guess, when the attempt counter is already at one, you again get nothing, and as the attempt counter goes to zero, the secret is permanently deleted, right? So it's now irrecoverable. And so the brilliant thing about counter lockboxes is that they already exist, right? They exist inside of the secure coprocessors in our smartphones, right? Apple has this thing called the secure enclave processor or SEP, where when your iPhone is sort of in a lockdown state, all of the things on the file system are encrypted under some key that you need to get by inputting the right passcode. And just as in the lockbox way, you have a few attempts at guessing the right password. If you do, you get the key back to decrypt all of your files. And if you guessed wrong too many times, you get permanently locked out, right? This is exactly the sort of uh, lockbox functionality implemented by secure hardware that consumers have access to. So additionally, these exist in many sort of cloud backup services, right? I have all my data stored in the cloud and I, you know, I lose my smartphone and I want to recover it somehow. Well, I can again make a few attempts at a guess of my password to the cloud. If I get it right, I'll get my data back. And if I get it wrong too many times, my data gets deleted, right? These are actually oftentimes implemented on secure hardware, but notably, right, these cloud, these providers, they won't let you run anything you want on their secure hardware in the cloud, right? The access they give you is exactly to something that looks like the counter lockbox functionality. So this already exists in several ways, which is why we'd like to build one-time programs out of it. So here, now we can get to the main results of our paper. First, we show that you can indeed build one-time programs out of counter lockboxes, and the number of lockboxes per input bit of the circuit actually asymptotically matches the previous result, right? We only need a constant number of lockboxes per uh, input wire. Uh, we also show that with some stronger assumptions, specifically a malicious receiver Laconic OT, which can be built using Laconic OT and SNARKs, then we can actually create one-time programs where the number of lockboxes uh, doesn't depend on the input length of the circuit, and in fact, only depends on the security parameter. This is a pretty interesting construction, but fortunately, I only have time to go over the uh, the first result here. Read the paper for the second one. It's very cool. Um, okay, so here's our approach in the nutshell. So we start by using counter lockboxes to build a form of leaky one-time memory, right? So in one-time memory, the receiver gets to learn exactly one of two values. In leaky one-time memory, there's a chance that they can learn both, right? It's maybe a low chance, but they can possibly learn both. So we then, so if we're using the approach with garbled circuits, right, we're already sort of shot here, right? Because if you learn both wire labels for some wire in a garbled circuit, your security completely collapses, right? So we then use some OT combiner techniques along with these leaky one-time memories to actually get the full one-time program construction. Uh, sort of in a nutshell, OT combiner techniques is you have a bunch of bad OTs, you can combine them all into one good OT, right? So we have all a bunch of these bad leaky OTs, we can combine them to make one good OT and then get sort of the same one-time program construction as uh, GKR with the garbled circuit. Um, the downside to this construction is that it actually requires a number of lockboxes that is too many or too much too way more than we want it requires uh, a number of lockboxes equal to the security parameter for each bit of the uh, each input bit of the circuit so that's too many so we then use some additional techniques uh, specifically robust garbling which is this really cool uh, technique introduced by Alma Shakba et al in uh, 2021 in which you have a garbled circuit where it's actually no longer catastrophic if the evaluator learns both wire labels for some number of input wires you can actually still, uh, your security is still retained. So this lets us essentially use leakier one-time uh, one -time memories, which lets us use fewer lockboxes, which gets us to the asymptotic result we saw earlier. Okay, so here's sort of the core of our, um, our result, how we end up building these one-time memories from counter lockboxes. So we again join Alice and Bob. Alice has two values, A and B. She'd like Bob to learn exactly one of them. So first, Alice secret shares her values A and B into two shares each, right? She then creates a couple of counter lock boxes. She builds two, one of which has each secret share of A inside of it and has the password set to zero. For, uh, for this construction, we assume that the attempt counter on every lock box is one. So you have exactly one attempt to guess the secret and then you're locked out forever. So I'm just not gonna show the attempt counter for the sake of space. 
So right, Alice has two lockboxes. One has a share of A in it. The a, one each has a share of A in it, and their passwords are both zero. Right. So she now does the same for the shares of B, except she sets the passwords to one. Right. Okay, so she now has four lockboxes. She shuffles them together and she gets some random permutation of the lockboxes. All right, so it's just a collection of four lockboxes. Now, to Bob, these four lockboxes actually look like uh, black boxes, right? He can't see inside of them. So I'm just going to label them one through uh, L0 through L3. So Alice now sends this collection of four lockboxes to Bob, and he needs to decide whether he wants to retrieve uh, you know, the left value or the right value, the zero index or the one index. So let's say Bob wants to learn the uh, the uh, the zero index value, right? He doesn't know which lockboxes contain the shares of that value, right? And, but he needs to recover both shares in order to recover it. However, what Bob does know is that the password to those lockboxes is going to be zero, right? And so he can just guess zero as the password to every lockbox. This guarantees that he gets the shares he wants while permanently deleting the shares for the other value, right? And so Bob will always be able to recover, you know, the value that he wants. If Bob were behaving maliciously, he could try and guess sort of the order of the lockboxes and maybe retrieve both. But if you increase the number of shares here, you eventually get to a point where the chances that Bob can actually recover both shares are, is uh, negligible, right? And so this is sort of our leaky construction. And then we combine this with robust garbling to eventually get the asymptotic result that you saw earlier. Okay. So just sort of a quick summary here, we show that you can indeed build one-time programs out of hardware that's already widely available. And sort of an open question here is, can the number of lock boxes be reduced? We already sort of, you know, got to constant, right? A constant number of lock boxes per input bit, which is pretty good, but our constants are not amazing in our construction. For instance, for like a 256-bit uh, input will require somewhere in the vicinity of 10,000 lock boxes, which is quite a few. We also have a brief analysis about how you can how much a lockbox actually costs, right? Like you can buy an iPhone that has a lot of lockboxes on it. You can, uh, you know, pay for a phone number that will then get you access to like a cloud service. And it turns out a lockbox costs around one dollar. So you know, ten thousand dollars for a for a single one time program is a little bit financially infeasible. So it'd be very interesting to uh, see if we can cut down the number of lockboxes that we actually need. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Questions. Is it easy to see that if you wanted to directly implement uh, a one-time memory, that the number of uh, the number of lock boxes you need would be super constant? Super constant. I guess because, yeah, because you want to you want to ensure that you know Bob has like a negligible chance of. I understand for this construction. Yeah. I under, but have you I thought about like a general yeah a general lower bound? That is a good question. Yeah, I uh, I don't think we've thought too much about general lower bounds. There, there, there has to be some amount of lower bounds, right? Like if you only have two lock boxes, you can't do much more than putting, you know, only A and B inside each one, right? So there, there are there's clearly some sort of like practical lower bounds there, but we don't we don't investigate the uh, the lower bounds too much. All right, let's thank right. the speaker oh. again. Oh, sorry, oh. question. Yeah, this may be a. Uh, um, uh, Basic question, but uh, for these lock boxes, uh, right? If if you use it and it expires, uh, right? The secret's lost. Uh, can you then restore it, or is that kind of just a broken lock box uh, from here on out? Uh, yeah, we uh, we model it as the ability to sort of restore it again, where you could then you know run rerun sort of the initialization procedure and have a you know store any new secret inside of it. But yeah, in general, uh, we assume that. Yeah, whatever the original secret was is gone forever, but maybe it's sort of a reusable box or something. Yeah, that we don't investigate that too much. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Okay, let's turn off first. Yep. Okay. Okay.
Don't press this button. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you can always use the air. Okay. Awesome. Uh, uh, our next speaker is uh, <laughs> is Benjamin Chan. He'll be telling us about universal reductions. And indeed, I will. Um, thank you for sticking around because uh, Rafael, uh, Cody, and I have we, what we think is a very cool notion for you today. Um, it's called universal reductions. We're going to be looking at security reductions and, uh, well, whether we have the right model. It used to be called cosmic security. I hope you appreciate the name change. Um, okay, so let's jump right in with an example. Suppose we had a weak one-way function and we want to build a strong one-way function f prime based on f, uh, and we have some construction in mind that's much harder to invert. How do we prove the security of f prime currently? Well, by security reduction. Uh, we can go back to the textbook and say, hey, suppose for the sake of contradiction that f prime is not secure, that there's some attacker that breaks f prime with some noticeable probability. Uh, then our reduction says that there exists a prime that inverts f, our assumption, with probability large. And this is a contradiction, and therefore f prime is secure, right? But observe that this proof is only useful to us uh, if uh, our model for attackers in the real world um, correctly captures, well, real world attackers, right? If we model attackers the wrong way, our security proof is broken, our assumption is broken, we had better be modeling attackers the right way. And currently, we assume what we call the extended physical church Turing thesis, which is that all real life attackers can be captured by PPT Turing machines, okay? And what this allows us to do classically is that we can write these black box reductions R that can query the original attacker A many, many times. For instance, when doing this hardness amplification proof, we might send a bunch of queries trying to invert some Y. So the takeaway here is that our black box reduction utilizes many independent copies of A currently, um, and that this is possible only because we model A as an algorithm, which can be copied and run again. And this is an implicit assumption that we're making in a lot of our classical security proofs. In this talk, we ask, what if we can't run A many, many times? We're going to challenge this physical Church Turing thesis uh, assumption. Maybe A is a next door neighbor, Cody, uh, who happens to be able to break F prime. Like maybe you can embed puzzles in like crossword puzzles or something, I don't know. Uh, but maybe you only have interact interactive access to Cody, okay? You have to like cross the fence, give him a puzzle, and then he breaks it. Um, you have no clue how Cody works. Uh, you don't know how, like Cody's code, like is the mind dictated by code? I don't know. Um, you can't copy your neighbor. Uh, you can't rewind your neighbor. Your neighbor might have access to like alien technology as far as you're concerned. We need to revisit classical proofs, right? Classical proofs will break down in this regime when we only have interactive access. And looking forward, even the simple act of sending two queries or correlated queries to Cody will be problematic because Cody is stateful. You can remember things. You can say, hey, I'll only respond to the first query you sent me, or maybe uh, I'll respond to correlated queries in a different way. So looking forward, we will have to assume that the adversary wins repeatedly when given fresh challenges from the security game. This sounds like a very reasonable assumption to make, but even this will be non-trivial to exploit as we'll see later. Okay, but let's take a step back and argue that stateful attackers are already very well motivated in practice and in theory, right? Quantum computers are stateful attackers because if you use uh, qubits and do measurements, the no cloning theorem says that we can't even copy quantum advice. Um, so we can't rewind quantum computers when we play these interactive security games. And theoretically, we would prefer a theory of cryptography that doesn't make this implicit uh, church turing hypothesis assumption. Like, can we get by without assuming that the attackers we, we are dealing with are algorithmic and can be copied or restarted or rewinded in nature? And in this talk, we propose that the answer is yes. We have hope that we can build a reduction-based theory of cryptography uh, that uh, makes minimal assumptions on the nature of real life attackers. And we hope you're on board. Okay, next up, we're going to define the framework we propose, and then we'll see uh, later uh, whether it's useful. Okay, let's jump right in. So universal reductions are going to center around what we call augmented adversaries. This is our new model for what a real life attacker is. It's just going to be a tuple A comma T and, uh, sorry, A comma NAT, and this NAT is some nature machine 
that corresponds to some unknown power in the cosmos to which we only, only have interactive access, right? It's, it might be unbounded. We don't know what the choice of runtime is. A, on the other hand, is some classical attacker that uses nature to break some scheme. Okay, and our augmented security game is now, well, C, A, and NAT. So our challenger C is going to be our security game. It's PPT. It's going to output win or lose. Um, and observe that the attacker in this execution uh, can alter the state of nature during the interaction. And that this is very in uh, intentional and a key property. And also note that in our model, all the communication is going to be classical and CNA are going to be PPT machines because we want our universal reductions to still work in a classical world, okay? And recall that we want a, a next door neighbor who wins repeatedly on fresh challenges. So let's define this now. We call this robust winning. And to this end, we define what we call an interaction prefix, which is just a transcript of messages and coins that nature previously saw, okay? That's all. And we say that our augmented adversary, A comma nat, has a robust advantage A if for all of these interaction prefixes, no matter what it saw in the past, um, the probability it wins a new instance of our security game on fresh coins is greater than or equal to A. And robust winning to us seems like a very natural uh, notion of winning. Uh, and this is why we, uh, we, we examine it in our, in our paper. Okay, so here's the main notion in our paper. Universal reductions. We're going to say there exists an epsilon universal reduction from two security, uh, from C to C prime. If for all PPT attackers A, there exists a PPT attacker A prime, such that for all natures, suppose that A comma nat has robust advantage A for the security game C. So it kind of wins on demand whenever you send it an instance of C. Um, then A prime comma nat has robust advantage epsilon for C prime. Notice that it's the same nat, the top and the bottom, and um, that A prime can now use the fact that A comma nat wins on demand. Okay, and this is the central notion in our paper. Uh, are universal reductions universal? Well, certainly. Universal reductions imply reductions with respect to PPT and QPT, and hopefully this is not too hard to see. Okay, so some quick comparisons. Relativized reductions, uh, well, relativized reductions give attackers oracle access to some arbitrary oracle, uh, if you're familiar. Um, so we can kind of view universal reductions as relativized reductions for stateful interactive oracles, okay, as opposed to stateless non-interactive ones. And let's talk about UC very quickly, which seems very syntactically similar to our notion. Um, we're just going to uh, mention that this is sem semantically very different uh, because our notion is reduction-based and computational. Uh, and for instance, UC security proofs can rewind the environment. Um, I, I think they're a little bit incomparable, but we can talk about it later. Um, but the main question I want to get to is this. What can we do with universal reductions? Okay. Ready? Okay. Uh, warm up, a basic feasibility result. Theorem one, classical single shot straight line black box reductions imply universal reductions. These are just classical reductions that run the attacker once. And hopefully it should be straightforward to see that, you know, we only need to use nature once so we can just I don't know, plug in the classical reduction and we get a universal reduction straight out of the box. And as corollaries, we get w, WI, PRG length extension, PRFs, SKE uh, commitments from PRGs, but not one-way functions. So what about problems that have classical reductions that invoke the attacker many, many times, like what we saw in the beginning? And unfortunately, the picture here is less clear because not everything is going to be possible. We're going to revisit two textbook proofs, hardness amplification and the Goldreich Levin theorem, and say that, hey, uh, let's just focus on hardness amplification for now. Um, we're going to say that, hey, it's impossible to write a universal reduction uh, for the one way function security of the uh, black, sorry, of the direct product construction um, to the one way function security of G of X. Uh, that uses only black box access to the one-way function uh, in question. And that works for any such function. Um, so basically, some sort of hardness amplification style theorem is going to be impossible if the reduction uh, is agnostic about how the function actually works. So let's go over the intuition of this proof uh, to kind of understand universal reductions better. Okay. So recall that like in the classical proof and Yao's proof, like you let G be a weak one-way function. We want to argue that this G to the N, this direct product is a strong one-way function. So assume for the sake of contradiction that G, uh, G to the N is not a strong one-way function. Uh, then we have some attacker that inverts it with some noticeable probability. 
Okay, and we're going to use this attacker uh, many, many times. Uh, say we want to invert some y equals g of x, uh, some weak one-way function image. Uh, we're going to send many queries with the same y embedded in random locations over and over and over again. And hopefully by doing this uh, and getting many responses, we can amplify the win probability of the original attacker. Now, can we write a universal reduction in this setting? Well, I claim that problems are going to happen, right? So instead of a classical attacker that wins on our strong wave function, now we get a augmented adversary that robustly wins with some small probability. But now consider the following augmented adversary. Uh, so A is just going to forward messages to NAT. And what NAT is going to do is it's going to keep a list of subqueries Y that it's previously seen. And as soon as it sees the same Y a second time, it's just going to say, hey, I reject your query. I've seen your query before. I claim that this is going to be a problem. And the intuition is that because nature is now stateful, um, if it previously saw Y, it can just reject future correlated queries that contain Y. So only the first query in Yao's reduction will be useful, and we have no hope of amplifying the win probability. Okay. Observe that this uh, adversary is still robustly winning because our only constraint, uh, the only thing we get is that it wins on a fresh challenge. And the probability a fresh challenge coincides with the set of string, uh, seen strings is going to be tiny. Okay. And in the full proof, we show that any reduction, not just Yao's, that uses G in this black box way, will have to send some sort of correlated queries to A common app. And that uh, this is similarly broken. And this is a non-trivial proof, but I'll leave it uh, for future, uh, it's for the paper. Okay, but the question is, hey, is this black box G uh, in G, is that inherent? Um, and the answer is yes, because we can in fact do hardness amplification in our universal framework uh, for specific one-way functions, right? In fact, if your one-way function is re-randomizable, and what do I mean by that? Well, basically you can take uh, some image and re-randomize it to look like a fresh image, but still have, I mean, you can re-derive the, the same solution. Um, we say that, hey, if F is re-randomizable, then we can do hardness amplification using the direct product construction. And for intuition, uh, this is because we can kind of fool nature into thinking it's playing fresh instances of our security game. Okay, so writing universal reductions requires new techniques. It's kind of hard. This is all we got. So let's try to climb a different mountain for now to have some results, uh, you know. So I think uh, I'm a little short on time, but uh, briefly let us consider the setting where, hey, can we get non-trivial results by imposing restrictions on nature? Maybe presumptuous to think that nature actually cares about what happens in previous security games, right? Maybe, I don't know, we're, we're tiny, like, I don't know, maybe these cosmic adversaries just don't care, you know? Um, maybe it just evolves over time over the number of queries it's received, but has a short-term memory and behaves independently of prior interactions. I don't know, I hope this sounds reasonable. So maybe we can think of this uh, augmented adversary as a sequence of attackers, A1, A2, A3, right? Same sequence of attackers. Uh, each subsequent one doesn't depend on the previous outcome, um, but it evolves over time. And the question is, can we uh, do anything in this setting? And our theorem says that, hey, if you have a classical non-adaptive reduction, um, then indeed it does give us universal reductions with respect to these time evolving natures. Okay. And I'm going to briefly describe what's going on. So on the left side, you have a classical non adaptive reduction. It sends queries Q1 through Q5. And because it's non adaptive, the order doesn't matter. And on the right side, we have a sequence of attackers that we have to query in order that we want to make work in this classical setting. And the question is, how do we emulate a classical attacker, a star, in the view of our classical reduction, using our augmented adversary? And I claim that this is pretty straightforward. Uh, you just send each query to a random A sub I. And even though we have to query these A sub I in order, uh, it doesn't matter because our non-adaptive reduction doesn't depend on the order of queries. Um, of course, we might get some collisions, so we have to make the sequence of attackers really large. But Generally, I just want to say, hey, it's rather surprising that we can deal with these stateful natures that evolve over time, uh, even classically. Okay, so time's up. In conclusion, there's a lot to unpack, but the takeaway for you is that we can write meaningful security proofs with respect to stateful attackers. 
And at the same time, new techniques are clearly necessary. We don't know how to do PRGs from only functions or MPC, but we do have hope uh, for a future proof notion of cryptography. And I hope uh, you do too. Thank you. Uh, let's start getting the next speaker set up. Uh, in the meantime, are there any questions? Yes. Hi there. So have you considered what happened when uh, you start from primitives that are, for example, secure against uh, quasi-polynomial time adversaries or sub-exponential time adversaries um, and try to construct a primitive that is only secure against, I mean, this type of adversary? Would that make... Uh, I mean, it's not so much the running time of the attackers that we were, I don't know, it depends on the reductions and I'm not super familiar with reductions for these sub-exponential time adversaries, for instance. Um, okay, but, uh, cheers. Yeah. All right, let's thank the speaker again. Our next speaker is Patrick Harasser talking us about talking to us about beyond Uber instantiating generic groups via PGGs. It does this, yeah, this works. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, thank you all for staying till the very end. So um, I'm going to be talking about a new definitional framework for assumptions on groups uh, called pseudo-generic groups, or PGGs for short, which allows to instantiate generic groups in a fairly broad range of applications. And this is joint work with uh, Baltazar Boer, Puya Farshim, and Adam O'Neill. So um, the starting point of this work is the observation that uh, very often cryptographic schemes with some sort of security guarantee are designed in a two-step process. So in the first step, you uh, design and then prove security of the scheme in an idealized model, where some component of the scheme is taken to be random. And then later on, uh, when the scheme is to be deployed in practice, you replace the random component with a public and efficiently computable instantiation. Um, although very attractive, powerful, and popular, uh, unfortunately, we know that this paradigm is not sound in general. Um, which means, uh, which motivates the question of finding assumptions on these building blocks which at the same time can be satisfied by the real world candidates that we have and which uh, allow to prove interesting applications. And this will sort of be um, the backdrop question for this talk. Now, um, if you have a look at the landscape um, of assumptions that we make about these building blocks, um, these very much depend on the building blocks themselves. So let me quickly run through a few examples. Um, the one component that is probably best understood in this regard is um, hash functions. So on one side, we have the idealized model, which is the random oracle model. But over time, um, there's plenty of assumptions that have emerged, which we think can be satisfied by, the, by our concrete hash functions that we have, and have turned out to be useful in proving uh, interesting applications. So another example is uh, permutations. Um, up until not too long ago, we had uh, no assumptions on permutations, so proofs would automatically be carried out in the random permutation model uh, until the work of Sonia and Tesaro uh, adopted the UCE notion of security for hash functions to the case of permutations. Um, now for the case of groups, uh, the situation is again a bit different. So we have a lot of uh, well-known assumptions that we know and love. There's also some generalizations thereof. Um, here I'm thinking about the Uber assumption, which speaks to the indistinguishability between um, a random group element and one that has a polynomial induced exponent. But we claim that even this generalization is insufficient when you want to prove security of certain applications. Uh, notably, think of those where um, group exponents uh, might not be uniformly random or polynomially correlated, but um, just simply high entropy. But in that case, even the Uber assumption falls short of, of providing the means to um, prove security, to prove security of the applications. So the goal of this work is to, um, to address this issue. And uh, given the success that the UCE style of defining security has had in the case of hash functions and permutations, our approach was 
uh, to take this paradigm and to try and adapt it to the setting of groups. Um, so my plan for the next couple of slides is to briefly recall what UCEs are and then show you how one can do this adaptation. So um, UC security is a security notion for hash functions introduced by Bellare, Hong, and Kilvedi. And the starting point for defining UCEs is uh, PRF security. So you see here the game, this is the classical game. Um, on the left, um, so a distinguisher should not be able to distinguish between two worlds. On the left, uh, sample a random hash key and then answer oracle queries with hash evaluations. On the right, ideal world, uh, pick a random function and answer queries with um, random function evaluations. Now, when you try to apply this security notion to hash functions, you run into a problem, which is that uh, pure F security immediately breaks down if the seed, which here is the hash key, is made public. And the problem is precisely that in hash function applications, the hash key is public. So um, the insight of the HK was to split the distinguisher into two parts. Um, the algorithm here at the top, which is called source, and the distinguisher at the bottom. So source still plays the PRF security game. So it has access to one of two oracles, but no hash key. Then can pass some leakage onto the distinguisher, who gets the leakage, the hash key, but no oracle and must decide which world the two are playing in. Now you might think that the natural requirement uh, would be to ask for this to hold for every source distinguisher pair, but you see right away that that's, that's a bit too strong. Um, so for example, the source could just query any fixed X to the Oracle, get answer Y, and then leak the pair X, Y to the distinguisher who then has the hash key and then can perform this check here on the right. So it can distinguish right away. Um, BHK suggests various, way around, various ways, ways around this problem. So for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to uh, focus on a notion that's called statistical algebraic unpredictability, which is the game here to the right, which essentially says that no unbounded predictor should be able to guess um, any of the source's queries, given leakage, when the source interacts with, with the ideal oracle. Okay, so this is UCE. Um, now let me show you how you can port this definition to the setting of groups. And let's start with the game to the left, which is again the game here. Okay, so um, we replace hash parameters with group parameters. Um, group parameters in, in our formalization are just a description of the, uh, of the group operation, a fixed group generator, and the group order. Now, um, hash key generation uh, is replaced with a re-randomization of, um, of the group generator. So um, the, the equivalent of the hash key is a, a new random group generator, which you see also here is given in place of the hash key to the distinguisher. And then in the real world, um, we replace the hashing oracle with exponentiation with respect to this unknown group generator. Now to the ideal world, well, um, the analog of group exponentiation in the ideal world is just a, a random injection from that P to G. So, so we'll use that in place of a random function. So these are already the changes to the UCE game, the game we end up with, we call the, the PGG game. The question now is, um, what's the right notion of, of unpredictability? Now, of course, the source must be uh, statistically unpredictable again, because otherwise you can mount the same attack as for UCE sources. But we claim that that's not enough in, because there's additional structure here that wasn't present in the case of hash functions and permutations. So let me give you an example of an attack. Um, suppose um, source uh, picks x1, x2 at random, and then queries x1, x2, and x1 plus x2. It gets these three elements as, um, uh, as Oracle replies. And then yeah, I claim that already the source can, can figure out which world it's, uh, it's playing in by just uh, performing this check over here. And you see that um, if the source is playing in the, in, the, in the real world, well, this will always check out. And in the ideal world, this all time it works. So the source just passes this one bit of leakage to the distinguisher. And of course, the three queries are unpredictable because you cannot predict a random number based on only one bit. So this is an attack that, that wasn't there in the case of uh, UCs and uh, PSPRPs um, because those primitives don't have any like homomorphic property, which this um, oracle here has. So to avoid this attack, we suggest to extend the notion of unpredictability and uh, we call our extension um, algebraic unpredictability. Um, what we do is we require that uh, no predictor be able not to guess even a linear combination of the queries made by the adversary. So not only 
it, it should not only not be able to guess any single query, but not even a linear combination thereof. Um, now, it turns out that even this restriction, unfortunately, is, is not enough, and there's still attacks to take care of. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the details, but let me just tell you that we address these issues by um, imposing a, a syntactic restriction on the source. So sources can still be unbounded, but we require them uh, to be non-adaptive. So they must declare all the queries they want to make first, and then have only very limited um, post-processing on, on the outputs. Okay, so this is the PGG notion. Um, now, whenever you uh, define a framework like this, there's at least two questions that one needs to take care of. Uh, the first one is, uh, do PGGs actually exist? And if they do, under what assumptions? And then the second would be, um, well, what interesting applications does the new framework enable? So for the first question, we show that um, a generic group satisfies this notion. Um, I can't get into too many details here, but I would like to highlight the two important parts. So one uh, concerns the modeling of sources. So in, in, in our treatment, sources can be unbounded, which means that the right way of modeling them in the GGM is to give them full access to the generic group encoding and not just, uh, not just Oracle access to it. Uh, this allows us to capture more applications and also pre-processing attacks, but, but of course comes with some technical challenges. And um, the right tool to address these issues is the bit fixing technique by Correcti Dodis and Guo. Um, so the second thing I would like to mention is that the proof is carried out in a slightly different way than usual GGM proofs. So normally in a GGM proof, you would um, appeal to the schwartz zippel lemma to ensure that you have uh, that your um, lazy sampling is, is consistent. We do not do this in, in our proof, but instead use um, algebraic unpredictability on sources to uh, to ensure that the lazy sampling was consistent. So in some sense, we, we reinterpret the schwartz zippel lemma, which uh, holds as a theorem for sources that output random elements. We reinterpret that as an assumption on the sources, which is exactly the assumption that allows us to carry out the proof, basically. Um, as for applications, let me give you a, a quick overview. So um, the first one, the easiest one, uh, is uh, the Uber assumption. We recover that via a direct reduction. Um, we also get generalizations of the Uber assumptions uh, where um, exponents are independent but high entropy and restricted versions of these assumptions have been studied before. So for example, uh, Canetti's DDH2 assumption is of this form. But we also have um, quite a few applications that do not seem to fall under the umbrella of the, the Uber assumptions. So for example, we construct UCEs for so-called simple split sources. And by doing that, we recover all the applications in the original um, UCE paper that can be proven using, using this class of sources. We also show that um, minor variants of the Algamal encryption scheme um, satisfy forms of KDM, deterministic encryption, and RK security. And we believe that, um, especially these, latter, um, these last applications here, um, showcase the power of the PGG notion because it allows one to prove um, security of simple and practical schemes in very advanced security models, as opposed to more complex constructions that are known in the literature. Um, as a corollary of our DGM feasibility result, um, we can also show that all our applications are secure against pre-processing attacks. Now, the applications that you see um, highlighted here um, in some form, in one form or another, use um, a hash function. And um, if you go through the proof, you see that it is hash function evaluations that the security um, that the security reduction queries to the PGG Oracle. So what we need for the proof to go through is that um, hash function evaluations are algebraically unpredictable if the hash function is queried on unpredictable sources. So in some sense, the hash function has the role of linking traditional unpredictability to algebraic unpredictability. Um, we formalize this as a new security requirement for hash functions, which we call linear dependence destroyers or LDDs. Um, the game is basically what you see here. So source outputs um, some uh, hash inputs and some leakage, and then an adversary uh, gets the hash key and must come up with a linear combination of, um, of the hash evaluations. Um, our results on LDDs are as follows. Uh, we provide instantiations for so-called low-degree sources. 
And we show that a random function is an LDD for certain parameter ranges. And we prove this via, via compression argument. Okay, so uh, let me conclude by quickly recapping what happens in a paper and then mention some open problems. So um, we, provi we provide a new definitional framework for assumptions on groups. We uh, show that the definition is void for trivial, uh, of trivial attacks by showing that, a, uh, that the GGM, the generic group satisfies this notion. And we show that some interesting applications follow from our notion. As for open questions, there's several ways to build on our work, we think. Um, it would be interesting to maybe increase adaptivity of our notion or to capture fixed generator no um, assumptions. Um, on the LDD side, it will be interesting to see if um, the candidate construction that we, uh, that we provide is, is an LDD for the whole class of statistically unpredictable sources. And finally, I guess the big question in the background um, that this work is just a small part of is, how far can we push this high entropy approach to connect um, uh, real, the real world and, and idealized models? For example, can we capture new models or can we capture more assumptions? Can we connect models? Insert your favorite question here. So yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, I have a maybe silly question, but um, so remember in the original definition of UCEs or hash functions, there was some, there was a later work that showed that if you have IO, it sort of would break all the definitions of uh, UCE. Uh, do you have similar uh, problems here or do, uh, can you avoid that? Okay, so the original work uh, on UCE is considered a computational notion of unpredictability. And that was exactly the problem. So the, the IO-based attacks are enabled by the fact that you consider a comp to only computational predictors. We directly go to the statistical version. So all predictors here are unbounded. Yeah. Um, do you happen to know if there are other idealized models that implied things like the KDM security of Elgamal encryption? Because I mean, obviously the generic group model does, and then maybe, is, is that it? Do you know? I don't know. I'm sorry. That's fine. All right, let's thank the speaker again. Oh, sorry. Help? Okay. Uh, so there is apparently going to be some closing remarks right now, and then we'll be done. Everybody, so um, that's everything. Uh, I just want to close the conference by acknowledging all the work that went into us. Uh, uh, first, starting with Ika and Vinod for their leadership as program uh, chairs. I guess we could do round of applause. To uh, everybody who helped on the program committee, everyone who wrote a review externally, there are hundreds of reviews that went into selecting these great papers. Thanks to them. Thank you. Uh, thank you to everybody who submitted a paper, who authored a paper here. Uh, thank you to the speakers, especially the student speakers, especially the student speakers bravely giving their first talks in front of the community. Uh, congratulations to all of you. And um, I'll acknowledge uh, Kevin and Kay have been in that Zoom room all week. Uh, <laughs> And we'll uh, make sure that these videos make it onto YouTube. They're also helping us before the conference. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Kay. Um, and the other people at the IACR who aren't here, like Brian Lamakia and Michelle Abdallah, really do a ton of work that isn't very visible, but it, they're doing good work because you don't hear about everything they're doing. Uh, they're not here to hear us, but thanks, you know, out there to Michelle and Brian. And, um, and then thanks to everybody who's physically here. Sandy and Jay ran the, the desk out. Oh, they're here. Thanks, Sandy. Thanks, Jay. Uh, they did... They both did so much work uh, in helping us. And finally, um, to our student volunteers, uh, Alex uh, was running this laptop and making sure it didn't fall apart all week. Uh, Jesse and Sam were running microphones around and JN um, uh, was also helping us at the desk. Uh, so um, thanks to them. Thank you. And uh, finally, 
thanks to all of you. I mean, if you all didn't attend the conference, there wouldn't be any reason to have it. So I hope you get something out of it, but your presence actually benefits everybody else. So uh, thank you and uh, safe travels um, back home uh, to wherever you are going. Okay, bye. <laughs>